And welcome back to the Fluence Podcast. I'm Uncle Bonehead. This is episode number seven. And with me, as always, I have... Democracy. There we go. <laughs> uh, if the first thing you'll notice, if you're watching the video version, this is not video. You don't see our lovely talking heads. Um, I made a mistake and ended up corrupting the file, so we're re-recording this again. And we're going to try this. Get as, get as much as in-depth as we did the last time. So, like I said, we're finishing up our discussion of the Web 3's identity crisis. Link is in the show notes. If you haven't read it, go read it. It is a very in-depth and informative uh, article about the big problems with Web 3. And they're, they're not stupendously huge, but they are there, nonetheless. I right don't... Um, we also mentioned in the other one, we mentioned the, uh, the, the pre-search, the grant vote. We want you to go vote for cryptocracy and, and hive vote early, vote often. <laughs> yeah. And if you've got, uh, if you've got more than a thousand pre in your account, then your uh, you'll get a 10 times modifier on your vote. Nice. A little, a little tidbit there for you. <laughs> um, I do want to throw in the show notes here also. The uh, Scott C. Business did a comprehensive, I think this was the biggest one he's done yet. He does, he does these social platforms uh, reviews periodically um i think it's what was the last year was the last one he did and it was like a hundred and some platforms this time he's got like 240 some of them on there um i'm gonna sum it up and i still want you guys to go watch it and but to sum it all up he agrees with us that hive is the best one by far so <laughs> yes Just, yes that is uh, sold out on decentralization, so he is going to lean toward decentralization. Uh, and there are a lot of platforms out there that claim to be decentralized, but they are really not. Nope. <laughs> there, there's several of them that I just don't, I do not understand what they, what they think they are. <laughs> I need to turn you down just a little bit more. You almost clipped. So, back to this article. Let's wrap this up. We are down on... Yeah, we didn't go, go over all the different kinds of things like uh, CyberConnect and, and uh, the ceramic and all of that right no we didn't yeah, we, we decided to uh to postpone that to never right <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very complicated <laughs> uh so so here it, it, it's the section called web3 social all sizzle and no steak challenges for web3 social he's talking about uh True socialization, how it happens is when users from form connections with other users when they share common interests, topics, background, and the socialization on chain is still far away from real world socialization. So what he's saying is basically true socialization happens when people start talking to each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and you know, online there are different ways that can happen, uh, but you know, true social media connects people together. That's the whole point. Yep. And the reasons behind this are speculation and financial incentive-driven behaviors. 
he says currently behaviors on chain are based on speculation and driven by financial incentives. The socialized data on chain are not based on behaviors that users are trying to build natural and effective connections with others. Yeah, um, I bring this out in my book uh, a little bit where I talk about uh, incentives are good, but if if those become the main point, then people are there for the rewards and they're not there for the socialization. Right. And, right. and that we've seen that happen on several platforms and it happens on Hive to some extent. Um, mm-hmm. and, but, you know, Hive is a blogging platform. It's a social blogging platform, which means basically you show up, you write your content, you know, whatever your thoughts are for the day. And then people show up and comment and interact, and that does happen on Hive, but for uh, but in a lot of ways, people are doing it not necessarily because they uh, want to engage, but because they want the reward. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and there are people there who are there for so, for the socialization, uh, but there are a lot of people there who are there for the reward. Right. It just right. I. I, I <laughs> To me, that's just not the reason to be in social media. It makes absolutely no sense. At least to me. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, social media, it, it, it's about the socialization. And if platforms can find a way to invent, incentivize people to be more social and to engage more in the content with genuine you know, engagement, and not just commenting because you know I want you know that extra point zero 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 one rewards. Right. Um, I think that that, if, that would be ideal. I think there's a you know how people you know like we do it. We've got a defluence podcast account on Hive. The, the the I did that because I wanted to separate it from me and you because it's not. That's that's solely for the podcast. I mean, if if you're going to do stuff like you know you're in it for just rewards, set up a separate account from your personal account. Work your personal account as you're on there talking with people. There's not there's nothing wrong with getting on on social media and using social media to promote your business. Just do it separate from your personal account. <laughs> That's yeah, and if you want, if you want to set up an account for the for the rewards, and and then another account for the engagement, you can do that. Just take take your rewards from your engagement account and delegate it to your re- rewards account. Right. That'll beef that one up, and then um, you can use uh, your engagement account to leave comments and interact with people on the flat platform and all that. You'll still earn rewards. But if that's not what that account is all about, you can always delegate those accounts to another account. That's right. That's right. People need to be a little more smarter. <laughs> Work smarter, not harder. That's right. Uh, his second point is the counterpart, a real person or not, which is kind of like what we just test touched on. Socialization itself is the interaction and connection between people. And now in Web3, interacts with addresses the current technical reality is that the addresses only hold data such as transaction history and assets held since such data does not help to identify real world real and valid target users connection building is very inefficient and ineffective so that's basically what we were just talking about um yeah and and web three uh you know uh, addresses are typically your wallet addresses. Mm-hmm. In Web 2, it's your, when we say addresses, typically we mean a website address. They can be the same, uh, you know, like unstoppable domains, sells um, web domains that are NFTs, and you can tie your crypto wallets to those. So that if you want to receive a payment, you just give people your Web 3 web address. Right. And right. receive uh, payment or whatever 
cryptocurrency you have um, connected to that wallet address. It's very, um, very and, similar and, to a high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it, the people don't typically see a web address as a real person. They don't see a wallet mm -hmm. address as a real person. It's a string of numbers and letters, and it's a lot less personal. So I think what he's getting at here is Web3 needs to be more personalized in the sense that addresses um, represent the real people. You know, like you could have your, your avatar, your, your image, your profile pic attached to that wallet address. Uh, that would give it a little additional personalization. Uh, people would see your face. Or if you want an avatar of, you know, a man on Mars, you can do that. But it's, it's, it's more personal. It's not just, you know, a string of names and uh, letters and numbers. Right. It's, it's a lot more human readable. And it's a lot easier to remember. Exactly. Um, his next point is data composability is not as easy as we thought. He says, although Web3 is the possibility of composability and applications are supposed to use different data models generated from various protocols, the reality is that protocols define their own data and business metrics based on their own business logic and operational needs. It is not realistic and pragmatic for an application to just grab and use whatever data models and algorithms other protocols created. So... What he's saying here is... English, please? Huh? <laughs> Plain English, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What he's saying is one one works for one and another one works for another, but they don't yeah. really mix each other. Yeah, they're not they're not interoperable. Right. Um, right. And so, like, um, on the Hive blockchain, for instance, uh, you can't port your data from another blockchain to... The Hive blockchain, right? They're not compatible with each other. So, uh, so he's what he's hinting at is that Web three ought to allow these various blockchains and platforms and protocols to communicate with each other. Right. So, so to put this in perspective, for my truck driver friends, <laughs> my redneck friends, you can't use a Chevy part. On a Ford. You can, but you'd have to modify it. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't just plug and play. So, right. so there's cut, you know, that's what these, these other like ceramic and other things are, are trying to do is to bridge the difference between the platforms and protocols. Yeah, and I and I can see you. I can see a use for that. I can see a, a need for that. I wonder though if if we'll ever get to that. Um, you know, developers kind of like to do their own thing. Yeah, they. I've, I've noticed a lot, like in the open source world and Linux and other, you know, technology, other platforms like Windows, Mac. They all seem to. Instead of just using something that already works, they want to try to reinvent it. Right. <laughs> so it it's, a lot of stuff doesn't make sense, but that's the way technology works. So, so I, I think I think he's he's pointing to the need for interoperability between the blockchains, between the Web three platforms. Um, but I, I just wonder if that'll actually ever happen. Um, uh, you know, there, I, I think I think it would be a, a beneficial thing, um, but it could also have some drawbacks. Yeah. Yeah. In 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 my altruistic view, yeah, I could see it working, but the biggest thing that I I fear is that some huge regulatory government entity is going to pop in there and say, oh, we need to regulate that. We can't just let that go anywhere. It wants to. We have to be the ones to tell 
how that works. And, and it never, once government gets their fingers into things, it never works again. Yeah, yeah, I can see, I can see that being a detrimental scenario. There's another one though, uh, where a big corporation, maybe a big tech company, you know, like mm-hmm. Google or Amazon or Facebook, is the one that creates that that protocol that that ties everything together. But it's motivated by profit, so they'll collect investors. Investors will pour money into it, and in order to use it you'll either have to pay for it or it will be uh monetized uh by the same model that they're using now which is um it, they offer it free to you but it's uh paid for by advertisers and sponsors and of course they're collecting your data yep it's it's, it's either I, I don't i honestly don't know which is worse a centralized big tech company or a big centralized government <laughs> i can't i have not figured out which one is actually worse <laughs> there one's about as bad as the other and what's really really worse is, is when they work together so <laughs> yes <laughs> yes uh and it, it, his next spot he's talking about is the user experience uh he says the first thing off the bat that that i've i've been saying for a while now there's too much industry jargon <laughs> airdrops cold wallets DeFi, diamond hands flat fiat currency hard forks gas hash rate private keys proof of stakes seed phrases stable coins smart contracts there's just too much of this stupid stuff you know it, it's just use the regular old common names you know instead of using past phrases and and private keys just to uh, just say a wallet is a password manager people will understand yeah, that yeah i understand i understand that there's some of these some of these though don't have other words i mean you know what's a, a stable coin is a it's a brand new thing there's no right there's no other equivalent you know it is what it is and so some of this involves some education um, uh, for new people that are showing up and, and aren't familiar with the jargon. Um, right. uh, so that's one issue. And then the other issue is you know, these words are often thrown about with hardly any explanation. Like there's an assumption with people producing content on these topics that everybody's going to know what we mean when we say hash rate and smart contract you know and that's not the case right it's you know they start throwing throwing around big words like that my eyes glaze over but that's just me i i understand it now because i've been into it for like two years but there's still a bunch of stuff that i have no clue as to what they are (laughs) yeah and and more of it keeps popping up all the time so you know uh, you know there you know every few months it seems like or every few weeks we have a new development and somebody's coining a new phrase and and (laughs) you're like okay what does that mean and you have to study that to figure out what they even mean yeah um you know to determine whether or not uh, you are even interested yeah it's like uh nfts non-fungible tokens why can't you just you know explain it to the people saying it's digital goods that's encrypted that you can prove? Yeah, is, and, is and a there are different kind. different kinds of NFTs now. So you have yeah, different uh, different protocols: ERC twenties, ERC eleven fifty fives, ERC seven twenty ones. You know, yeah, and it can get complicated. And if you're new to the space and you're coming across all of this, you really. Um, you have to decide whether or not you want to invest the time to learn if uh, you just want to blow it off and uh, go have an ice cream cone. Right. And, and then his, his next session is, you know, he's talking about the the uh, user experience is not just about how the product looks, but how it works, how easy the onboarding is, how easy it is used, how scalable the solution is, how practical the gas prices are. Right there, there's another one, gas prices. 
Nobody knows what the hell gas prices are. They're thinking... We're not talking about filling up your Chevy here. Yeah. (laughs) Gas prices are transaction fees, but nobody understands what a transaction fee is and why do you have to have a have to pay a transaction fee when you're on social media it's not yeah. it's not actual physical money <laughs> people <laughs> yeah and, and and that's the thing is uh you know you're moving you're moving your obscure token from a platform to your private wallet and you have to pay a gas fee or a transaction fee in another cryptocurrency. <laughs> right. They and just... you got to figure out how do I get that cryptocurrency? You know, a lot of times it's Ethereum, but it's not always. It depends on which blockchain you're on. Um, and, and yeah, it can get confusing. Yep. It's... We need to get rid of all that. <laughs> not all of it, or at least cut it all back so people will understand. Then we'll get the, the, the adoption. Uh, his next point is Web3 should solve real user pain points and bring unprecedented values to user. Uh, decentralization of data and information and ownership of data and contest, content by its users is a great narrative to tell, but decentralization itself is not actually of immediate practical or pressing importance to the majority of users when decentralization comes with higher cost. That users have to pay to use these those protocols. He's right. People ain't going to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, especially if they don't understand it. You right. know, um, and, and that's the that's the biggest problem I think in the Web three spaces. We haven't really done a good job of selling people on decentralization. Nope. Um, and and I tell people, you know, decentralization doesn't solve every problem. Sometimes I want things to be centralized. You know, when I go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac, I don't want them to have to go one place to get the lettuce, go to another place to get the meat. (laughs) Oh, got to go across the street to get the buns. Hold on right here while we order out some pickles. It just takes too long. It's inefficient. Yep. Uh, But the purpose of decentralization uh, is not to make business more efficient it is to make data more secure that's one of the benefits and so we have to do a better job of really explaining what the benefits are right um he's he's talking about next he talks about uh, where can we explore digital identity is a crucial crypto problem to solve before social applications boom uh he talks about a web 2 digital identity is siloed and not fully defined by users um like on facebook twitter and all that your information that you gave them is sitting on a server somewhere in a database that can be hacked um with web3 yes the blockchain is all public but it only knows what you tell it and it's encrypted so once you have to have that key to decrypt it then you're the only one that owns that key yeah and it's encrypted and often the data isn't just sitting on one server somewhere right it's distributed across uh many computers uh with vast um you know uh, geographic distances between them and so if one computer is taken down you know through an attack then you have other computers that are still operational the network doesn't go down right uh so so it's safer that way and it's more difficult to hack because of the encryption and because of the distributed nature of the network Uh, that's where decentralization comes in (laughs) exactly yeah uh he talks about the soulbound token, SBT. Oh, yeah. It's a permanent, non-transferable NFT, meaning that they can't be given away or taken from users' private blockchain wallets. Soulbound tokens are digital identity tokens that present, represent the traits, features, and achievements that make up a person or entity. 
I believe this was introduced by Vitalik. Huh? Yeah, Vitalik. Ethereum. Co-founder of Ethereum. Ethereum. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, uh, there's it, a pretty good discussion about um, Web three identities and and how they should be uh, how they should be constructed. And the whole idea between the soul bound token is that every individual has a unique, non fungible token that is just for them that serves as sort of their ID card, um, their universal ID card online. And uh, so, you know, for instance, if you if you go to university and you get a degree in, you know, biopharmaceuticals and now you are a master poobah of the greatest <laughs> drug on the planet you have an identity a digital identity uh, token that catalogs that for you <coughs> and and you can't transfer that to somebody else you know because what employer wants to hire somebody who bought their degree from the guy who actually earned it right very true. Yeah, so that's the whole idea behind Soulbound. Right. And I suppose we should probably, before we wrap it up, because that was the last part of it, was he was talking about the Soulbound token. And then he gives a bunch of references. You guys, I, go, go check out this article. Read it. Reread it. Read it a third time. Maybe even a fourth if you're like me. It consume might take it. five or six. <laughs> consume it. You're a consumer. Consume it. That's right. <laughs> and then also go pick up Crypto's Social, the book by Alan Taylor. Its links are in the sidebar of the of defluence dot online. It's it's a very it's a very good book. I've read it twice now. I need to read it again. I, you know, I talk about some of these Web three issues that we're discussing in this series and this that this article discusses, and talk about the benefits of you know the technology and you know the crypto social space in general, the social media space within crypto, uh, and several different platforms within that space that are doing some pretty interesting things, and so. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good book. I'm, I'm working on a follow-up book now uh, that will um, be geared toward creators. Uh, I'm talking about the same topic, uh, but in a little different way um, for, for the creators of the web. Nice. That's going to be good. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> You'll be one of the first. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we should mention the app protocol since it's in the show notes. This is uh, created by Blue Sky, which is, what's his name? Jack Dorsey, the original Twitter owner, uh, founder, whatever. And this looks like it's just a protocol, not an actual blockchain. Yeah, uh, it doesn't look like it's blockchain based. I mean, it looks... Uh, it looks to me like it may be um, federated or at least facilitate um, federation. And because uh, he's got uh, his talking points there uh, where he talks about you, know, you, you can incorporate it if you are uh, a federated type of a social platform. Um, you have algorithmic choice. In other words, you can choose the algorithm that you want to use. Um, to define your social media and then portable accounts, which we talked about um, how you can import, you know, port your identity and port your content from one platform to another. I'd be interested to find out which social media platforms actually adopt this protocol. Right. It sounds to me more like he's trying to compete with the Fediverse than he is trying to compete with social blockchain social. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, Jack Dorsey is a, he's a fan of blockchains. He's a fan of Bitcoin. He's a fan of decentralization. Um, but I, I'm not real clear 
on what this particular protocol is supposed to accomplish just looking at this web page um it's created by blue sky when he first started talking about this a couple of years ago i was under the impression that blue sky was going to be creating a blockchain based protocol but right. this doesn't look like it's blockchain based to me wouldn't that be something if it was a combination of metaverse and blockchain <laughs> I mean, that's possible, I guess, but uh, uh, the, the blog post doesn't, I think it's geared more toward developers than anyone else. So what I think what he's trying to do is offer a development tool to social media platform developers to make their product a little bit more um, interoperable with other blog, with other social media services so that users can actually take their data from one platform to another. Cool. So, I don't know. I, I, you know, so far I haven't seen anything that says Twitter has adopted it. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't see that happening if, if Elon's I would buying suspect, it. <laughs> well, I would suspect that Twitter would be the first because this was developed by um, Jack Dorsey, who was the CEO of Twitter. He's not anymore. And the CTO of Twitter, and as far as I know, he's still there. Ah. Well, that's going to depend on what happens with, with the Uncle Elon. Yeah, you just don't know. Well, Elon and, and, and Jack Dorsey are becoming good friends, I, I understand. So. Oh, really? Huh. Well, there goes Twitter. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, on a side note about the Fediverse... I installed Mastodon on my on my home server this morning, so I'm gonna go play with that a little bit after we get done here. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, so I I, I read uh, you know just a, like a week or so ago about private text between uh, Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey uh, Jack Dorsey uh, involving Twitter. Uh, Interesting. And, and those, yeah, those private messages took place earlier this year, um, just before Dorsey uh, resigned, I believe. Really? Um, and so, yeah, it was very interesting. You go to Business Insider, or you can uh, Google Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey and uh, Business Insider. You should see there's an article on it there. <laughs> Insider... Dorsey. Yeah, Jack Dorsey sends private text to Elon Musk about Twitter. That was uh, <laughs> September 29th on Business Insider. That's going to be interesting. Well, we'll check that out later. You guys can email us at uh, podcast at defluence.online. Uh, for because of the screw up, we're like right on top of everything right now for release. So I don't know if we're going to try to get back to being more advanced. <laughs> uh, but we'll see you guys next week. This this year, actually hearing this or yeah, hearing this the day after we record it. So this is going to be this is a little different for us. Yeah. So, um, hey. Be sure to like us on social media and, you know, check out cryptocracy.substack.com. Um, I've known some uh, news curation in the crypto space there and trying some experimental content. So uh, look me up. Absolutely. We shall talk to you guys again next week. Be good. Be safe. Never stick your finger where you wouldn't stick your face. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs>